Hi guys, um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I am a consultant cardiologist in York. And today I wanted to do a video which is um, titled, Why I Don't Believe That Atrial Fibrillation Causes Strokes. Now this is a very provocative title and I will try and explain my reason for doing this video and also then try and tell you why I really don't believe that atrial fibrillation causes strokes, okay? A few months ago, I put a video out on the subject of ablation. Uh, and that received quite a lot of criticism from people on various sites. Um, even on the video, there was a bit of criticism because they said, oh, well, you know, I said in this video, I said, well, if, even if you have an ablation, you shouldn't stop your anticoagulants um, because, um, because I believe that the risk of stroke persists even if you have an ablation and your atrial fibrillation goes away. Um, and a lot of people wrote back and said, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, uh, my, my, my doctors stopped my anticoagulants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the first thing, so that, that, and I want to try and prove why I think that, um, I think that people should not stop their anticoagulants even after they've had a successful ablation. Let me talk you through this, all right? Number one. There is no doubt that people who have atrial fibrillation are more likely to have strokes. The risk of stroke goes up five times in people who have had atrial fibrillation. But we have made this assumption that because people who have atrial fibrillation have more strokes, that it is the atrial fibrillation which is causing the strokes, okay? And that is why people say, well, okay, so if I get rid of the atrial fibrillation, then I won't have strokes. And therefore they say, well, if I could be cured from atrial fibrillation, okay, then that means I'm cured. You know, I don't have to worry about these things. I don't need to worry about this. And what I want to tell you is that I don't really believe that atrial fibrillation causes the strokes in the first place. And therefore, even if you get rid of the atrial fibrillation, I don't believe it really makes a huge difference to your stroke risk. Okay, so here is the deal. Number one, in, let me tell you, let me just get this paper out that I was reading. Um, here we go, okay. There was a very interesting paper published. There's lots of reasons, okay, but let me talk you through these. Here we go. Um, there was a very interesting pub paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1987, okay? The lead author is Stephen L. Kopecky, K-O-P-E-C-K-Y. You can find that on pubmed.com. From 1950 to 1980, they recruited 3,623 patients who had atrial fibrillation. The special thing about these patients were that they were young, they were under the age of 60, and they had no other conditions, i.e. they only had atrial fibrillation, maybe they had it once, maybe they had it a few times, maybe they had it all the time. But they did not have high blood pressure, they did not have diabetes, they did not have heart failure, they did not have heart disease, and they were young, okay? And these guys then followed these patients up for 15 years. And at the end of 15 years, they calculated that only 1.3% of the original number of patients had had a stroke. So they concluded that the risk of stroke was incredibly low in these people. And therefore, there was really no merit in giving them anticoagulants because the risk of stroke was so incredibly low. These are all patients who had had some atrial fibrillation. Remember that. Now, then there was a very interesting study in the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2007. The lead author is Miyasaka, M-Y-A-S-A-K-A. -A -A. Okay, again, available on PubMed to read. Here they said, okay, let us follow up patients who have atrial fibrillation but who also have comorbidities, i.e. 
who are older, so the mean age was 73. Remember the previous study, everyone was young. Here, people were above, around about the age of 73. They had other comorbidities like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart failure, etc. And they found 4,618 patients. Okay. And by the end of the follow up period of five and a half years, between five and 10 years, but uh, <clears throat> the mean follow up was about five and a half years, they found that 3,085 of the 4,618 patients had died. Okay. And in these people, they found that it was an incredible, these patients had a very high risk of strokes, very high risk of death, very high risk of complications. So the question therefore is that if you have atrial fibrillation and if atrial fibrillation causes strokes, why the discrepancy in one group who is young and has no other comorbidities but has atrial fibrillation and they all live for a very long time without strokes and then you have another group and who have exactly the same condition but who are older who have other comorbidities like diabetes high blood pressure and why do they all do so badly with such a high risk of stroke so how can it be the atrial fibrillation which is causing the stroke when you have atrial fibrillation in both groups and there is such a discrepancy in their overall prognosis so that's the first point okay number two here's another very interesting paper that i came across let me just find it sorry i'm just going to find this um, other paper here which is here we go here's another really interesting paper okay now it was published in Europace 2012. The lead author is Shan Mugam, S H A N M U G A M. Okay. And what they did was this they found patients who had heart failure. Okay. And these patients had had a special kind of pacemaker put in called a biventricular pacemaker because that can sometimes make the heart failure symptoms better. The advantage of having such a device in is that it will pick up if you develop any atrial fibrillation, okay? And so what they did was they used this device to pick up silent atrial fibrillation or any atrial fibrillation that may be occurring in these patients. And they found that there were patients, there were patients who had atrial fibrillation and there were patients who had stroke, okay? But the majority of patients, 73% of those patients who had had us who subsequently went and had a stroke uh, did not have any temporal relationship between episodes of atrial fibrillation. I, yes, they were getting atrial fibrillation and yes, they had the stroke, but the stroke did not happen when they were having the atrial fibrillation. Okay, in 73% of time, those patients, there was no relationship between the time when they were in the atrial fibrillation and the time when they had the stroke. And therefore, that gives you more uh, uh, insight into the fact that maybe the atrial fibrillation is not the cause of the stroke. Because if it were, why wouldn't they be happening at the same time? Okay, number two. Number three, if you go to any cardiologist with atrial fibrillation, the first thing they try and do is they try and work out your risk of stroke. And they use something called the chads 2 vasque system to calculate your risk of stroke. Okay, now nowhere in the chads 2 vasque scoring system does it say that you have to be in atrial fibrillation. Being in atrial fibrillation is not considered a risk factor for developing stroke. Yes, it is used in people who have atrial fibrillation, but you may have had atrial fibrillation, you know, seven months ago, uh, and uh, you may now be back in a normal heart rhythm, which some people do, uh, which some people are in. And when you go to have your risk calculated, nowhere does it say, oh, well, your risk goes up because you are now in atrial fibrillation. They say, well, you were in atrial fibrillation so many months ago. I know you're in sinus rhythm now. You're not even in atrial fibrillation. But your risk of stroke is calculated by 
whether you have your comorbidities, whether you're older, whether you're above the age of 65, whether you have diabetes, whether you have high blood pressure, whether you have um, uh, heart disease or heart failure, those are the things that increase your risk of stroke. Atrial fibrillation itself uh, is not one of those uh, 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 one of those variables that uh, gives you a point or increases your risk of stroke. And that is why those people who score very low, okay, but have atrial fibrillation are not given anticoagulants. And those people who score highly are given anticoagulants. Well, if the atrial fibrillation was causing the stroke and you've got patients who have atrial fibrillation but otherwise don't have any other comorbidities, why are they not being given anticoagulants? They're not being given anticoagulants because the atrial fibrillation itself is probably not the cause of stroke. It is the company it keeps. The company being diabetes, high blood pressure, old age, etc., etc., etc. And that's another um, <clears throat> important point to bear in mind. And therefore, those people who said to me, well, my doctor stopped my anticoagulants after my ablation, the reason those anticoagulants were stopped was probably because you didn't need them in the first place. You didn't need the anticoagulants in the first place. You were only put on the anticoagulants for the purposes of the ablation. Okay, The ablation does not mean you stop the anticoagulants. The ablation has nothing to do with the anticoagulants. You either need anticoagulants or you do not need anticoagulants. If you don't need anticoagulants, but then go for an ablation, sometimes they give you an anticoagulant just to cover you during that period because they're doing things to your heart. But otherwise, they stop it. So those people say, those people who were saying, oh, well, you know, you don't know anything. How can you say that? My doctor stopped my anticoagulants. I've never needed them. Well, you probably didn't need them for the atrial fibrillation anyway. You were given those anticoagulants because you were going to have a procedure performed on your heart. Okay, but those people who have a high CHADS2 VASC score, even after they have had a successful ablation, are left on their anticoagulants. And all the major guidelines say this, and pretty well much every electrophysiologist will say that if your risk before your ablation was high, it doesn't matter whether the ablation is successful and we've gotten rid of the AF or not, you still continue on the anticoagulant. Okay, one last interesting point, and that was uh, a study which was done uh, in patients who have uh, pacemakers and who had never had AF. So there is the reason it was done in people who had pacemakers, etc., was because then you can be absolutely confident that they've never had atrial fibrillation because the pacemaker will detect any atrial fibrillation. Okay, so they didn't want to contaminate the sample by people who had this silent AF. Okay, so you 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 know you are sure they've not had any atrial fibrillation, and they calculated their CHADS two VASC scores. They calculated their age, their diabetes, whether they had high blood pressure, etc., and they followed these people up. And actually, these people who had never had atrial fibrillation, but who had a high CHADS two VASC score, had the same um, risk of having events like strokes as those people who had atrial fibrillation as well. And therefore, again, this makes us think that maybe atrial fibrillation is not the cause of the stroke. Maybe atrial fibrillation is simply a marker and tells us who is at a higher risk of stroke because of all the other comorbidities that they carry. And this is why when you go for things like an ablation, etc., you know, you are not really, when you go and you think, and a lot of people said, well, you know, this is the only cure, we, we can cure the atrial fibrillation. What does that mean? What are you saying? What does a cure mean? If you're thinking that the cure means that you're not going to have strokes, you're very much mistaken. Your risk of stroke is based on the comorbidities that you carry, the company that the atrial fibrillation keeps, not on the presence or absence of atrial fibrillation. Okay, um, so uh, let me just give you a little bit about myself. I hope you found this useful. Uh, if you find that you want any of the papers, come on and join me on my Facebook page. Uh, sorry, this was the title. Um,
I said, this is my Facebook page, yourcardiology at gmail.com, uh, www.yourcardiology.co.uk. Uh, some people have said, look, you know, what do you know? You're not an electrophysiologist. I'm not an electrophysiologist. I accept that. Um, but I do look after patients who have atrial fibrillation and um, I do uh, manage them. And um, uh, there's some feedback from the patients that I actually look after and that you can find on www.dralia.co.uk and um, uh, if you type in Sanjay Gupta cardiologist you'll uh, you'll get some feedback from live patients all right thank you so much for watching um, uh, keep the comments coming in please uh, feel free to ask me any questions uh, and please feel free to come and join me on my Facebook page um, and I hope to put some more videos out soon but I really really appreciate all the great comments I get and great feedback. Uh, thank you so much.